What's up folks, Mike for CMCC Builds here, back with optimizing the Baldur's Gate 3 Companions, part two. If you missed part one, and given the number of views, I'm assuming most of you did, feel free to go back and check that one out after you watch this one. Order isn't particularly important. The sponsor for today's video is me. Check out my Patreon if you wanna support the channel and head over to the Gauntlet Discord if you wanna test out your tabletop builds or discuss Baldur's Gate with some of the strongest optimizers in the community. Let's jump into it. Lazelle is a tough companion to figure out, not because she doesn't have any good options, but rather there are so many good choices, it's difficult to narrow it down to just one. We have to go fighter per the arbitrary rules, and as the joke goes, the best fighter multiclass is six levels in fighter and another six levels in fighter. The best fighter dip, however, is 11 levels in fighter and one level in fighter. Action surge, three attacks, and four feats with either one. Can't go wrong there. If you want to go straight fighter, that's absolutely a fine path. I've seen paladin dips, monk dips, war cleric dips, all are fine options as well. But the one we're going with is more of that classic gish, with just a hint of magic to help our defensive and out of combat capabilities. The word gish comes from Gith Yankees, and as our resident Gith companion, we're going this route for Lazelle. For abilities, take a 17 in strength, 14 in dex, 16 in constitution, 10 intelligence, 8 wisdom, and a charisma. For equipment, use the best medium or heavy armor you can find. If you're going the medium armor route, you want that 14 dexterity, and winning initiative is incredibly important. How important? Check out this video here for a tabletop analysis. Through anti-ethyl and other vendors, you can buy enough giant strength elixirs that an argument can be made to just dump strength. However, we're gonna invest in that stat. The weapon of choice will be the best two-handed weapon you can find. I played this build with a polearm using Polearm Master, and to be quite honest, I didn't love it. It wasn't nearly as effective as it can be on the grid, and I found that there are enough weak enemies in this game to make that extra bonus action attack less valuable when combined with the mandatory feat we'll take with any two-handed melee weapon. So for our starting class, we're taking Fighter. The fighting style we want is either Defense or Great Weapon Fighting. GWF isn't the best fighting style, and defense is generally much better, but with so many great magic armors, and the ease by which we can increase our armor class in the game, the defense fighting style is quite a bit weaker than standard tabletop 5e. So feel free to take great weapon fighting for a slight damage boost. At level 2, I see a lot of people taking War Cleric here. If 3 bonus action attacks are worth it to you, go this route. The better choice, in my opinion, would be Light Cleric for unlimited warding flares, but despite that, we're going with Wizard, the classic Wizard Fighter multiclass. This allows us to take the amazing shield spell. All our spell slots will be used on this spell. We only get two and a third with Arcane Recovery. This means that the remaining spells should be out of combat ritual spells with no saving throws like Long Strider, Find Familiar, Disguise Self, Enhanced Leap, and Featherfall. Exactly six total spells. Perfect. At level three, continue with Fighter. At level four, Fighter three, select a subclass. Eldritch Knight is a really good option, but the one level dip in Wizard should be enough to satisfy this build's casting needs. If you want to build a thrown weapon tavern brawler character, go this route. But we're taking Battlemaster. It's super strong with the subclass's maneuvers and perfectly in character for Lazelle as a tactical killer. There are so many good options for maneuvers, I'm not going to go through all of them here, it's outside the scope of the video. At level 5, respect to straight fighter to make sure you get extra attack on time. You also get that fourth level in fighter and take Great Weapon Master, of course. This gives the power attack and a situational bonus attack. With two attacks and this negative five plus 10 power attack, along with potentially the precision attack maneuver, Lazel should kill enough enemies to proc that bonus action regularly. At six, go ahead and get that level in wizard back. Level seven, fighter six, you get an extra feat and take Tavern Brawler here to bump strength to 18 and take advantage of this feat's craziness. Throw a drunken kobold or an obnoxious goblin and let the fun begin. The thrown damage on this feat has been fixed, so it's no longer broken, but it's still quite strong, especially as a half feat. At eight, get some more maneuvers, and at nine, you can take another feat. Get that strength to 20. Again, if you're relying comfortably on elixirs, you can bump other stats like dex or con, or simply take strong feats like alert, lucky, or even tough. At level 11, respec again to make sure you get that third attack as soon as possible. Take a couple more maneuvers at this point. You should have a wide variety of options for most of the situations you'll find yourself in. Push an enemy off a cliff or into an area of effect spell, bump your attacks when you need to finish off an enemy, move an ally that's about to go down, get an off turn attack when an enemy attacks you and misses, and so on. At level 12, 
Finish off with that level of wizard again, and you're done. Shadowheart, the Daughter of Darkness. This is an interesting one because the build I'm recommending doesn't fit at all until you make certain choices towards the end of her character arc. If you've completed the game, you probably know where I'm going. As a follower of Shar, the Night Singer, the goddess of night and loss, many of the cleric options just don't make thematic or story sense for her. Trickery Cleric isn't very good in BG3, despite it being fantastic in 5e. Yes, it is fantastic. The spell list is amazing, even if the class features are subpar. Along with not being very good in BG3, Trickery doesn't fit well. Neither do Life, Light, Nature, Tempest, or War. Knowledge can work, but I actively dislike the subclass. It's not terrible or anything, it's just my preference. I've seen a lot of people suggest Twilight Cleric as a nice to have 5e option. But even that doesn't fit thematically. In fact, the suggested Forgotten Realms deity for Twilight Clerics is Saloon, and we know how that goes. Death or Grave Domain would probably be the best fit, but alas, tis not to be. So kind of spoilers, we're going with late game Shadowheart here, when the shadow has lifted and she finds a new direction, and one of, if not the most powerful clerics in this game, the Light Cleric. But we're not doing anything fancy, 1 through 12, Cleric all the way. Dump Strength, 14 Dexterity, 15 Constitution, either 12 in Intelligence or Charisma, whichever your party needs, 10 in the other, and 16 Wisdom. At level 1, we're going Light Cleric, it's the best Cleric subclass in the game, like I just said. It's where many of us took her story, it's a good fit, eventually. If that bothers you early on, squint in your eyes and pretend she's a Grave Cleric for a while. You want the best medium armor since Light Cleric doesn't get any additional armor proficiencies. At this level, Light Clerics get Warding Flare, which is just fantastic, especially as an unlimited resource. Level 2 gives Radiance of Dawn, which is a strong area of effect blast early on in the game. In fact, at level 2 it may be the best damage AoE in the game. Pay attention to the auto-prepared spells from this subclass. There are some nice ones, including Flaming Sphere, Fireball, Wall of Fire, and Destructive Wave. At level 4, with the feat, take Resilient Con to get Constitution to 16 and get Constitution Saving Throw proficiency. Clerics have a lot of great concentration spells from Bless at 1 to Spirit Guardians to Planner Binding. Maintaining that concentration, especially on Spirit Guardians, which requires moving close to melee, will be of the utmost importance. At 6, Improved Warding Flare allows you to protect your allies. Choose wisely. I know I and, and many others call this a resource-free ability, but it actually does use a resource, your reaction, and you only get one of those per round, so make sure you don't protect an ally with a ton of health, only to let the ally about to go down get knocked unconscious because you used up that reaction. At level 8, Warcaster is a fine option if you want to make failing a concentration check much less likely, but I'm going to bump Wisdom to get those DCs super high. At 10, you get Divine Intervention, again, use it wisely. This is the definition of a finite resource, one time. And at level 12, with the final feat, bump Wisdom to 20. Take advantage of all the Cleric summons, they get some fantastic ones, especially at higher levels. Don't shy away from Undead and let those Guardian Spirits carve a path in battle for you. Will was dead easy for me, he's the Blade of Frontiers. He's dedicated his life to a singular calling, defeating the evil denizens that would harm Baldur's Gate and its surroundings. He called upon the powers of one of those evil beings in a questionable attempt to defend the weak by growing his own abilities. He's a melee fighter that hops into battle with a rapier in hand and his heart on his sleeve. Evildoers be damned, he's coming for you. This is the classic Hexadin, the Hexblade Warlock Paladin multiclass in 5e. But there's a problem, Hexblade doesn't exist in this game, but it kind of does. As Pact of the Blade now takes the Charisma weapon portion of the Hexblade's level 1 ability, meaning the Warlock Paladin multiclass still works. It just takes a few more levels of Warlock now. On top of that, it allows us to take a different subclass that fits better narratively. When respecking Dump Strength, 14 Dexterity, 16 Constitution, 12 Intelligence, only because his original stats have a higher intelligence, 8 Wisdom, I actually prefer Wisdom to Intelligence, so if you don't care about how the characters were originally specced, I'd switch this with Intelligence. And finally, a 16 Charisma. If you're playing this straight from 1, you need to go straight Warlock through 5. But at level 8, you can respec to the final version of the build. Start with Paladin to get heavy armor proficiency, and at this level Will needs a subclass. Again, this seems completely obvious to me. Following the ideal of the knight in shining armor, you act with honor and virtue to protect the weak and pursue the greater good. Oath of Devotion is a perfect fit for Will. The guy effectively gave up his soul to help the weak. Spot on. Paladin 2 gives smites in a fighting style, dueling is the top pick. 
but both defense and protection are decent options, with the latter being a top option for story character reasons. With Paladin 4, bump Charisma. Charisma not only powers your Paladin spells and Warlock spells, but eventually your attacks and damage too. Paladin 5 brings extra attack. Older versions of this build would split extra attack between Paladin and Warlock, since the Thirsting Blade invocation would stack for a third attack. Unfortunately, Pact to the Blade's extra attack no longer stacks, so the primary incentive to dive deeper into Warlock no longer exists. The higher level spell slots are nice, but not enough to forego the higher Paladin levels and spells, especially since Paladin spells and Warlock spells are kept separate. Because of that, we only need three levels in Warlock. Choose the Fiend Patron for story reasons and for some extra HP when killing enemies. No Hexblade means no shield spell option, which sucks, but Armor of Agathis and Hellish Rebuke are nice options. Eldritch Blast provides a nice ranged option, filling a massive hole with the Paladin class. Warlock 2 grants two invocations. I always take Agonizing Blast, and then it comes down to Repelling Blast, but that tends to keep me out of melee more than I'd like, or Devil Sight if I plan on casting Darkness. The latter is the better option for a melee focus build, giving yourself advantage to hit against most enemies and preventing the majority of ranged attacks from even being able to target you is very powerful. Warlock 3 and Will can take Packs of the Blade to bind a packed weapon and use Charisma for attacks and damage. Paladin 6 gives you an aura, which needs to be activated for some reason. Don't forget to do so, I always do. At Paladin 7, the aura prevents the charm condition. Don't forget about the three channel oath options of Holy Rebuke, Sacred Weapon, and Turn the Unholy. Paladin 8, bump Charisma to 20. And finally, at Paladin 9, you get Remove Curse, Beacon of Hope, and access to some strong level 3 Paladin spells like Warden of Vitality. There you go, those are the builds. Let me hear about your selections and builds in the comments below. If you liked the video, please like the video. If you made it this far and want to support the channel, consider joining my Patreon for write-outs of all my character builds and other fun options. Otherwise, consider subscribing to the channel. See you here next time, folks.